Hello everyone, Phil here, and welcome to DSP React and my weekly clips react show, DSP versus the Internet. This is episode 73 for July 14th, 2024. As always, we start with the clips submitted by my Ultra members on the channel. These are guaranteed to be watched every week, so if you become an Ultra member today, you too can get your video watched here on the show. Please consider it. All right, let's watch these first, and then we're going to go over to submissions to your members who go into a randomized playlist, which we will just start watching somewhere in the middle and go from there. Also, if you become a super member, you have the ability to ask me uh, a question for Q&A. And actually, I believe there is one question that we will answer later in the show. We usually do that right around the beginning of part five for the week. Okay. All right. Without further ado, let's do this. Let's see what's first. The Native American war chief who helped defeat the Nazis. Let's find, let's learn about him. Maybe I should turn my controller on first. Let's learn about him. Fun fact. Joseph Medicine Crow was the last war chief of the Crow Nation, achieving the status while fighting the Nazis in Europe during World War II. To become a war chief, Joseph had to pass four tests while at war. He had to take an enemy's weapon. He had to touch a living enemy without killing them. He had to lead a successful war party. And finally, he had to sneak into an enemy camp and steal a horse. Hold on. Someone had told me about a new feature on YouTube, and I want to see if it's enabled or not. Stable volume auto. Yes. So YouTube has this new feature. It's supposed to be called stable volume. It's supposed to make it so that videos all will play around a stable volume. Because previously, different people's videos would go all over the place like this. And I'd be like, oh, shit, I got to keep adjusting the volume. Let's see if that feature works. Okay, I've just adjusted the volume of this video, so hopefully we can hear it. If any video sounds too loud or too low, let me know and I'll adjust it. Let's see if this feature works. Okay. Joseph was born on a Crow Nation reservation in Montana in 1913, and he learned the traditions of the Crow Nation from a young age and came from a long lineage of Crow Nation war heroes. Joseph's tribe's history inspired him to study history and anthropology in college, and in 1939, he became the first member of the Crow Nation to earn a master's degree. But on his wow. way to his doctorate, he left university and volunteered for the army. Before battles, Joseph Medicine Crow painted two red war stripes on his arms in the Crow tradition. He also carried a yellow eagle feather into battle with him that was given to him by a Sundance medicine man. During a raid in France, Joseph encountered a German soldier alone in an alley. He knocked the German's weapon out of his hands with his rifle, thus taking a weapon from an enemy, and he took the German soldier captive, touching a living enemy without killing him. During a tense moment for his company, while they were surrounded by German soldiers, Joseph's commanding officer put him in charge of a mission to take seven men to go get more ammunition and bring it back to the front lines. Joseph led the mission successfully, turning the tide of the battle and saving his company. Now you might not think horses would still be used in war by the 1940s, but due to the limited access to oil, horses were still heavily relied on to transport artillery and supplies. During the final days of the war, during a German retreat, Joseph tracked a group of Nazi SS soldiers escaping on horseback. Joseph followed the troop until they came to rest in a pasture where they camped for the night. Joseph's company surrounded the German troops, but before they attacked, Joseph suggested to his commanding officer, maybe he should go free the horses so none of the German soldiers could escape on horseback once they began ah, their assault. Smart. His commanding <laughs> officer agreed, and Joseph snuck into the enemy camp, created a brittle from a short piece of rope as crow warriors had been doing for centuries, and then leapt onto a horse and rode away, leading a stampede of 50 more horses. As he rode out of range, his army division launched their attack, and Joseph sang a Crow Nation praise song as he rode his horse back to camp. When Joseph Medicine Crow returned home from the war, the elders named him War Chief, and he also wow. earned a Bronze Star and a French Legion of Honor for his service. In 1948, Joseph became the official Crow Nation historian and anthropologist, and wrote the script for the reenactment of the Battle of Little Bighorn, based off the oral histories he had been told as a child. In 2009, Joseph was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and at 95 years old, performed a ceremonial dance after receiving the medal. Joseph died in 2016 at 102 years old. Wow. The only other member of the Crow Nation to come close to achieving war chief status since Joseph Medicine Crow was his nephew, Carson Walksoverice, who fought as a Green Beret in Vietnam. Carson managed to complete three of the four requirements, but was not able to steal a horse. He did, however, <laughs> manage to steal two elephants, which he believed should have counted for something. 
Carson Waxoverice was brought up in a traditional Cronation home, and in September of 1964, Carson enlisted in the U.S. Army paratroopers immediately after finishing high school at the age of 18. He completed the training program and then spent a couple years in the Panama Canal with the Army. In 1967, he volunteered to go to Vietnam because he wanted to do his war deeds, just as his uncle Joseph Medicine Crow had done during the Second World War. Carson Waxoverice was a Green Beret and a platoon sergeant, meaning he was frequently dropped behind enemy lines and was in charge of 47 men. Since the Viet Cong were very good at identifying officers and people in charge, American soldiers would avoid wearing insignia on their uniforms. Hmm. So Carson Waxoverice would put an eagle feather in the netting of his helmet, so when he was giving orders, his troops would know it was him talking. This also takes care of one of the war chief requirements. Carson Waxoverice led many successful war parties. Carson Waxoverice had gone to Vietnam to become a war chief. He carried a piece of rope in his knapsack at all times and was always looking for a horse to steal, but oh, never man. saw any. During a firefight, a Viet Cong soldier came running past Carson Waxoverice through the brush. Carson grabbed the Viet Cong soldier, took his weapon, looked at him, and in Vietnamese said, run, releasing the enemy back into the jungle. Uh -huh. The other soldiers in Carson's platoon were shocked. They asked Carson, why did you let him go? Carson replied, the important thing is that you saw me do it. That's all you need to know. Completing the tasks of taking an enemy's weapon and touching a living enemy. Carson walks over ice, continued to look for a horse, but the Viet Cong just didn't have them. Then what- This is just crazy that like, the whole, the whole thing to go to war, they just gotta do these objectives so they can be a war chief when they go home. That's crazy to just, you know, it's like playing a video game. I, of course, it's nothing like playing a video game. It's real life, but- the analogy here is you play a video game, but it has the optional objectives to get the achievement. You don't have to do them. Obviously, the goal when you go to war is to survive and, and, and defeat the enemy. But they have optional objectives they need to complete to become a war chief. I need to steal the goddamn horse. Where's the fucking horse? <laughs> that is kind of messed up. There's no horses. So he can't complete the objective, but he stole elephants and they wouldn't count that. Why not? Come on. Wow. Anyway. One day, while he was on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, Carson heard a crackle in the bush and looked up to see an elephant being ridden by a Viet Cong soldier. Yeah, see? Carson shot the soldier, which startled the elephant and caused it to come running towards him. The elephant had a chain hanging around its neck, which was dragging on the ground. And when the elephant ran up to Carson, he grabbed onto the chain and hung onto it until the elephant came to a halt. Wow. When the elephant did finally come to a stop, he noticed there was a second elephant tied to the first elephant, and both of them were loaded with guns and ammunition. Wow. Carson took the two elephants and led them back to his camp. So Carson figured when he got home, he would get credit for a horse. But when he did get home and told the elders what had happened, they shook their heads and said, Sorry, Carson, elephants are not horses. Come on! And Carson was denied war chief status because he had not been able to steal a horse. Wow. Just two elephants. Carson Waxoverice was wounded twice during the Vietnam War and was medically discharged in April of 1968. Carson lived with a bullet in his leg for the rest of his life. Oh my Carson God. Carson Waxoverice earned a total of 14 medals, commendations, and badges during- Holy moly, look at that. Damn, they gave him everything. He has like almost everything. Wow his time serving in the military. After his time in the military, Carson earned a major in business administration, minoring in German studies, and he was fluent in German, Crow, Latin, and Spanish. His wow. children nicknamed him the walking computer because he always had the answer to every question. <laughs> Carson died in 2011 at the age of 65. Wow. Oh. So ah. Okay, hold on. Wow, that was interesting. I mean, that that his delivery was kind of dry. He's just basically reading. You can tell he's reading from a screen because you see his eyes are moving like this as he reads what he's what he's saying. But that was, I didn't know anything about that. I had no idea that the Native Americans had these objectives they needed to complete to actually hit status in the tribe. And so to be a war chief, you actually have to go to war and do that. I mean, but that doesn't make sense. For example, now, wouldn't it be impossible for anyone to ever hit war chief status because there's no wars with horses anymore, right? So how would you ever, ever hit war chief status today? You couldn't. It's impossible. So I don't know. Don't you think that they should redo the requirements to become a war chief at this point? Hmm. Not all Native Americans. It was only that specific clan. Oh, no, I understand that. It was the crow, right? The crow. But still, like, they should redo that. That's not fair to everyone moving forward in the future. <laughs> Jeez. He lived to 100 
He lived to 102. Wow. All right. This is interesting. So when I started on YouTube 16 years ago, I was playing a game called Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix. It was the game they're about to talk about in this video. It was a Western remake with widescreen HD hand-drawn graphics and completely rebalanced gameplay. Okay? I played it and liked it. It wasn't perfect, but it was a good attempt to modernize the classic Super Turbo for a modern audience. But a lot of people hated it because of the changes in the art style. So honestly, it only lasted a couple of years and it fizzled out just like every attempt for someone to try to rejuvenate Super Turbo. Um, this is a video about it. I don't know if we'll watch the whole thing, but uh, let's see here. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, or Super Turbo for short, is a classic... Too loud, right? So, I don't think that this audio balancing thing is working. It just, it jumped in volume. So now I gotta lower the video, yeah. Sadly, it doesn't seem like the, the, this thing really works. Okay. Fighting game that really needs no introduction. This game is what I think of when I picture the term boom of fighting game in my head, and the amount of stabbings that I assume have happened due to Balrog throw loops is astounding. But while Super Turbo has had a passionate and dedicated fan base for three decades, there is a lot of jank associated with the game. From semi-random damage and stun values, stored supers, and more, Super Turbo has a lot of gameplay quirks that the game's fanbase adapted to over the years. Since this is an arcade game that was re-released on systems that are super old nowadays, it's not like the game ever got a big balance patch, right? Oh! I have to say, Released I think the original on the intro Xbox is better. 360 and <laughs> PS3 as a digital game in 2008, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix is exactly that, an updated revision of the original Super Turbo. With balance, visual, audio, and presentation changes, HD Remix is a complete overhaul of the original, and despite playing it constantly as a kid, I honestly forgot this game existed until I recently found my copy of Capcom Digital Collection. Not having internet oh, as a kid meant I couldn't download this game, so having it on this disc was the only way for me to play it. Upon revisiting the game, I realized that HD Remix was primarily developed by former American studio Backbone Entertainment, yep. the new music was created by Overclocked Remix, a video game music tribute site, and the new visuals were created by Canadian comic book studio Udon, who you might know if you're a Street Fighter fan, meaning that most, if not all of the game, was created by Westerners. There's a lot of stuff to cover in this video, so buckle up and get ready to fly around the globe, because we are going to cover Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix. His accent is crazy. HD Remix? It's HD, not HD. You don't need to pronounce a H breathing sound. It's HD Remix, not H. H is not how you need to pronounce the letter. <laughs> Before we dive into HD Remix itself, we need to learn a bit about why Capcom trusted a seemingly random American studio with the Street Fighter IP. Founded in 2003, California's Backbone Entertainment mostly focused on ports of older arcade titles to the Xbox 360, like Gauntlet, Joust, Frogger, etc. However, they did have experience with creating their own brand new IPs too, like 2005's Death Jr. for the PSP. One game they released in 2005, other than Death Jr., was Capcom Classics Collection, an Xbox ah. and PS2 compilation game that featured 22 of Capcom's arcade titles. This was the beginning of the working relationship between the two companies, and during the development of this compilation, Backbone producer David Serlin, who you might know from games like Fantasy Strike, pitched two new titles to- He was a- he's an actual pro Super Turbo player from back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Capcom. A redrawn version of Puzzle Fighter and Street Fighter 2. While the former released in 2007, fighting fans had to wait for a new version of their beloved fighting game, which honestly wasn't doing too well at the time. I'm sure we all know about the quote-unquote dark ages of the early 2000s, so I won't yep. get into it. But what's important is that Capcom also gave the green light to a new version of Street Fighter 2, and in an interview with the former xbox Focus website Team Xbox, Capcom's former senior director of strategic planning and research, that's a title and a half, stated that fans were constantly asking for a high-definition Street Fighter game on Capcom's online uh -huh. forums, persuading the big C to deliver such a game. While it may seem like a straight remake of the original arcade release, HD Remix is actually based on Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo Matching Service, a Japanese exclusive Dreamcast port of the game that includes online play. 
In an interview with 1up.com, David Serlin reveals that in the beginning, the developers focused on getting the Dreamcast port to run on the Xbox 360 and then fix any issues that popped up during this console transition. The scope of the project was very, very small at this point, and Serlin states that, At this point, our project scope didn't include a rebalance mode at all, didn't include tournaments, didn't include the rollback style networking, didn't include widescreen mode, and didn't include remixed music, just to wow. name a few things. <laughs> was very we were most then. focused on getting the game working correctly, making sure all the internal settings were exactly like the arcade version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and getting a menu system up and running. The developers then received a dev kit in June 2007, allowing them to change Super Turbo's code and compile new builds of the game for testing purposes. That all sounds well and good, but the game's new art style was arguably the biggest challenge for the dev team. The character art situation was scary, because Udon and I didn't believe that the contractor could produce the quality we needed. Capcom had hope though, and we stayed the course for a while. The contractor's quality actually did improve, but not enough. They were also extremely late. I don't ah. know the details of the course change there, but a long way into the project we finally switched art houses. This time, I think Udon picked the contractor. The change on the art side took a lot of ramp up time to get going, but by the end, they deliver the art amazingly fast, and it was still good quality. So that was like the major problem of contention with the game is originally it was supposed to be our Udon. Udon was a studio that was making comic books of Street Fighter and people really liked the art style of the comics and they were supposed to draw all the art for the game, but then they couldn't produce it like they were supposed to in-house make it. And it was just they were always behind. They couldn't re reach the deadlines for it. So then they, they basically outsourced it and they came up with all this art. Some people like the art style. Some people just hate it. They just crapped all over the game saying, oh, I hate this style for Street Fighter. I, personally, I don't mind it. I think it's good. I don't I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I think it was nice to just have a modernized version of the game, but some people just couldn't get over how it looked. They really, really detested the art style for some reason. During my research for this video, I was unable to find who this original contractor was, but yeah, they don't sound amazing. After an online beta test was conducted in June of 2008, many networking issues were found and resolved. And speaking of online play, HD Remix uses GGPO for its networking, which was yep. pretty uncommon to see in the early 2000s, especially from Japan. After a period of constant development and balance changes, the developers ended their work on the game just in time for launch, avoiding any potential delays. But before we move on, I feel like I have to discuss the game's radical new art style in a bit more detail. I mentioned before that it was done by Udon, and personally, I'm a bit mixed on it. The Having to redraw everything about the game from scratch and still maintain the original game's sense of speed and weight could not have been an easy task, and while it doesn't look bad per se, something about it all sort of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. Some characters' facial expressions like Chun-Li's, for example, look pretty uncanny to me, and the game definitely looks like a budget title if that makes sense, it sort of reminds me of a Flash game in ways. Although it was cut from the game due to concerns over the file size, the original Super Turbo's iconic intro movie was remade with Udon's new art and animation, and... Yeah, I don't know about this. To be honest, I really hate to be a negative person in my videos and just in general, but I've got to say that I think the original is leagues better. Some stages were did. also remade too, and I actually think these are pretty cool. We can now see the Taj Mahal in the background of Dalsim stage, and the Golden Nugget Casino of the original game has now been renamed Crazy Buffalo, for example, in Balrog ah. stage. Ah! Okay, let's move on to the gameplay now. HD Remix features the same button layout as the original. Three punches, three kicks, and motion inputs for the specials and supers. So on the surface level, it seems as though the gameplay is exactly the same as the original Super So the guy looks so interesting because this version, he looks like he does in Street Fighter Alpha where he's like more bulky and muscular. In the original Street Fighter 2, he's skinny. He's just supposed to be a, thai, a, a, a Muay Thai fighter. Muay Thai fighters typically are not giant roided dudes. They're just, like, skinny. But they're lanky, but they're strong, and their their hits are like very devastating. They're they're more grappler, lift you into their knees and stuff, rather than worrying about being big buff dudes. So honestly, Sagat that when they changed his visual style, it looks more like modern Sagat, but actually doesn't really fit a Muay Thai fighter. Turbo, but this couldn't be further from the truth. David Serlon's personal website, Serlon.net, contains a full list of balance changes for HD Remix. Yep. And while some characters like Ryu only received one new addition in the form of his fake fireball, characters like Zangief had their inputs changed completely. Yep. Green Hand is now performed with a quarter circle forward motion, and SBD can now be performed with a Potemkin Buster input. Another example involves Chun-Li, and she lost her downfall medium kick command normal, with Serlin writing on his website that this move only ever got in the way, so removing it is actually a buff to her in his opinion. Before we move on even further, I'd also like to focus on Akuma for a bit. 
In the original Super Turbo, he's banned in competitive play due to him being an overpowered boss character, but in HD Remix, he's received plenty of nerfs to place him on the same level as the other characters. He now takes more damage, has more startup on his fireballs, has a slower super, etc. So lots of work went into retooling Akuma for competitive play, but even then, I still hear that he's really busted. Yes, and basically when this game came out, it was both myself and Domdai were trying to prove that Akuma should not be playable in tournaments. Even with all of these nerfs that they gave him, he was still the best character in the game. He actually had completely inescapable setups where you could throw an air fireball land and the opponent couldn't move. And you could do a move that would guarantee a throw, combo, or a raging demon. So you could literally dominate the entire game just throwing air fireballs into setup and no one could do anything about it. But Serlin, I hate to say it, Serlin, listen, David Serlin is a well-intentioned guy, but he only plays certain characters in Super Turbo. Like he's a Honda player and a Chun-Li player. He doesn't play the cast, all the cast. So he doesn't even understand <clears throat> that some of the changes that he made to the game are actually bad. He thought that he made like the perfect version of Super Turbo, but he didn't really consult everyone who was like a master of certain characters. Like he didn't ask anyone about DJ. He just did whatever he wanted with DJ. Why don't you ask good DJ players what should happen with that character? He didn't bother. He only basically tweaked the things that he had personal issue with since he was running the project for Backbone. So a lot of the changes, a lot of the pro players did not like at all. Okay. And it ended up being disappointing in tournaments. Like people liked it for about six to eight months. And then people kind of gave up because everyone realized that Akuma was still by far the best character in the game and couldn't be beaten. And he completely locked down like most of the cast. And, you know, it was just stupid. So it was a good attempt. It sadly did not rejuvenate, rejuvenate Super Turbo though. I've only played the original game casually here and there, and I've never tried to properly learn it, so I didn't really notice any of Ken's changes, for example. Oh, Ken's broken Most as shit. Most of the gameplay changes involved tweaks to frame data and damage, nerfing some moves that were too damaging or safe on block, and buffing those that were a bit weaker in those aspects. A character that was ridiculously strong in the original game was Old Sagat. Yep. Even though we had no supers and couldn't take throws, his range, speed, damage, etc. was all out of this world, and he's insanely strong as a result. In HD Remix, Old Sagat has been removed, and he's now based on New Sagat, albeit with some tweaks to make him fairer to fight against. Yep. After doing some research, I found that a lot of tournament players didn't really care for the game's new balance, as it still has lopsided matchups, and hell, even characters like E Honda got buffed hardcore. This guy received changes that allow him to have an easier time against fireball characters, while also remaining super strong against characters who lack fireball, so he just kind of does well all around. And that's because that was Serlin's main character. So Serlin's like, oh, well. Honda's not that good. Let me buff Honda. Wait, what? Just because you like the character, the, the character gets a buff? Like, what's going on here? How is that, how is that competitively feasible? Just because you like the character. It didn't make sense. Like, he didn't consult enough people to make changes across the board that made the game better. He just tweaked what he personally wanted to tweak for his own benefit. <laughs> In the game's menus, you can turn on dip switches that allow you to change certain move properties, such as regaining the ability to store chun Li Super, for example. These are fantastic to have, as they allow players to experience certain parts of the original game while still keeping some newer aspects of HD Remix at the same time. Regardless of whether you like the new balance changes or not, it can't be denied that lots of work and passion went into the gameplay changes of HD Remix, and I commend the developers for this. When it was finally released, HD Remix was a smash hit. The game sits at an 88 on Metacritic, and review outlets such as Games Radar and Giant Bomb even gave it perfect scores. HD Remix's gameplay, smooth online play, and updated presentation were lauded by critics, although Smooth online play is hilarious because at the time, this was one of the first games to ever use GGPO rollback netcode, and although that netcode is way better today, I mean look how it's implemented in Street Fighter 6 and how smooth that game looks, <coughs> this game would frequently have a monstrous rollback. Monstrous rollback. So you'd be doing a, a fight and all of a sudden goes backwards entire moves and frames. Like, wait, what? Like, it, it was actually quite frustrating to play it online. Watch some of my footage from back in the day. Some of my earliest YouTube videos are of this. It's just, it's a mess. You know, they, they dramatically improved the experience for rollback netcode later. But this was the first instance of rollback netcode, and basically it became almost like a joke in the Street Fighter community how bad it was online. The new artwork did cause some division between fans. Even though a decent size of the community really liked the new artwork, the other half hated it and they ripped into the game for it. 
but look, overall, reception to the game was very positive. After the release of HD Remix, Capcom started to re-release more of the older fighting games for the PS3 and 360 in full HD with online play, like Third Strike, for example. I'd like- That's completely wrong. That was not full HD. All that was was a straight-up port of the arcade version. There's no, no improved visuals or anything. I mean, you could say it's HD, but it's the pixelated graphics just upscaled. So that's actually not true. However, the online mode was great in that one. It was much better, and it was actually the best online version of Third Strike at that point. To think that HD Remix's <laughs> success ushered in a new digital era for Capcom, where they focused on ports of the older fighting titles with improved netcode and presentation. In 2009, Backbone and Capcom collaborated once again for the HD re-release of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, which yep. also received positive critical reception. Unfortunately, Backbone closed the Vancouver studio in 2009 before shutting down entirely in 2015. Marvel vs. Capcom 2's HD ports was the final collaboration between the two studios, and while David Serlin has continued to work on competitive games outside of the fighting game genre, he hasn't done anything with Capcom recently. With all of that said and done, I honestly think I'd still prefer to play the original Super Turbo. While I do like HD Remix and have spent a lot of time with it, the game not being on PC is a blow to its availability, whereas you can easily download the original ST on Ficade in like 3 seconds and jump into a match online. Having a full remake of Super Turbo with brand new art, audio balancing, etc. must have been very exciting to Street Fighter fans back in the day, and the game was a smash hit as a result. Capcom themselves stated that the game achieved record-breaking sales, securing oh, a wow. bright future for the series. If you don't have a PS3 or an Xbox 360 anymore, you can try emulating the game on PC, which is how I recorded footage, and I recommend giving this game a go if you want to experience some new balance changes to a classic fighting game. What's sad is, that's probably it for Super Turbo, and what I mean by that is, they, they gave it a full-on shot to be a modern game, did it sell? It did. I think they said it sold like 250,000 copies, which is good for a digital fighting game. But basically because of the uh, criticism in the fighting game community for the art style, the, the, the bad online experience, and the brokenness of the rebalance changes, I think that's it. I don't think Capcom will ever try to bring back Super Turbo again. And here's the thing. I still feel the original Super Turbo is like the best competitive fighting game ever made. I still stand by that statement. This day, even after playing Street Fighter Six for a year, I still think ST is better. And <laughs> I've said this many times, and I'll say it again. You want to make money? You want to make? You want to really bring fighting games back to the forefront when it comes to the uniting of old and new? Make Super Turbo Two. Just call it that: Super Turbo Two, not Super Street Fighter Two Turbo Two. Just Super Turbo Two. Make a game with a core 15 to 20 characters. They play basically like in Super Turbo. There's not insane amount of gimmicks. You don't need, you know, fucking drive rushing, drive impact, counter move. Just basic fighting game gameplay. Bring back some of the classic characters. Add in some characters that have been in, in Street Fighter since then. And make it play like a classic fighting game like Super Turbo. And you will, it will succeed. 100%. Because you'll have old school players coming out of the woodwork to play it again. And the new school will just jump right in. You're going to have complete generations colliding for the first time ever. Because right now, most old school players don't play the modern games. They don't care for them. I don't blame them. They play so differently with these insane amount of mechanics, gambling, loop strings and stuff. They don't play anything like the old ones. I would love to play Super Turbo again. I would love for a game that plays like Super Turbo to reemerge in the fighting game scene, but we haven't had it. I would love Super Turbo 2. That's, that should be something they would do, and I think it would it would be a huge success. But I don't think we're ever going to see it. I think this is it. This is like the last attempt, the last hurrah to revive Super Turbo in a modern way, and it just didn't do as well as they probably wanted, and that was that. So, all right, guys. That is it for part one of DSP versus the Internet. I hope you're enjoying it. I'll see you in part two for more of the Ultra Member submissions.